and the ones that are, you know, the ones that have lasted are the, are the ones who the, were the owners. You know, the owners took the time and spent the money and kept the boats up for all that time. Finding uh, shipwrights that can work on wooden boats, uh, that's getting more difficult. Uh, we're lucky in the CL area, we, we still have some good uh, shipwrights. And, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a skill of the past. You know, there are no new wooden boats made, being built. What'll be the end of these boats is the cost of maintenance and availability of maintenance. Very early on, schooners like the Mary operated as sailboats. It wasn't long, however, before the long line fishermen converted to power. Right now we have a Cummings uh, KT 1150 is called. We have it tuned down to uh, 365 horsepower right now. And that makes for a real efficient, uh, long lasting engine. Uh, originally they were uh, powered by gasoline engine. And uh, that, the gasoline engine didn't last long. I think they about two years and they uh, they uh, quit the gas. It was just too dangerous, you know, having gas aboard. As tough as they are, even these old halibut fishermen found it hard breaking in. I got seasick the first three days of every trip we went for the first three years. You know, and it was miserable, but when I got home at the end of the year and I looked at those paychecks, it was pretty good. So that that kind of kept me interested. Knutson made his first trip on the Grant in 1954. I was 14 years old, I was having the best summer of my life. I was playing for four different baseball teams and fishing was the furthest thing from my mind. And I, I got a call from Pelican, Alaska, said, you're a man now. And uh, I didn't feel like a man and uh, I want you up here tomorrow morning. So my mother said I had to go, I didn't want to go. And uh, Knutson arrived in the tiny village of Pelican by seaplane. His father was busy when he arrived. He said, I haven't got time for you right now. Just uh, go talk to the guys or help them out. So I, I'm standing there like an idiot, and uh, he was splicing some gear, and one guy says, yeah, I spliced this. And uh, he gives me a couple lens, and I'm standing there. What am I supposed to do? And he looks at me with this look of absolute disgust, and he said, you're 14 years old now, and you don't know how to splice? And <laughs> and McHenry broke in a generation later. 1978, I was 24 years old. I had the good fortune to be on a boat where we, we had quite a season, a very impressive man share in it. I can remember I went into the bank, had long hair in those days, and walked into that bank, and I, they weren't a little reluctant to serve me, you know, help me out. And I transferred this, all this money from the National Bank of Alaska to a local Seattle bank. And the teller just looked at me and said, Are you a drug dealer? I said, No, I'm a halibut fisherman now. Like her sisters, the Seymour was originally conceived as a mother boat, designed to carry dories to do the actual work of fishing. When she reached the fishing grounds, the Seymour lowered the tiny boats, each carrying a pair of fishermen. Seymour was built as a dory boat. It was one of the early halibut schooners. So she was built to carry six dories, and I imagine about 14 men, which is quite a few people on an 80-foot vessel. Originally they were rigged with dories, and this this boat had six dories, 15 men. The uh, the skipper, the cook, and the uh, and the chief engineer they stayed on board the boat, and you were two men to a dory, two fishermen to a dory. It's extremely uh, extremely dangerous method of fishing. You're out in the middle of the ocean, basically, on a, a little 16, 17 foot uh, wooden dory. If it got foggy or bad weather or something, they'd uh, have a hard time picking the dories up, hard time finding them. They lost an awful lot of people in the dory fishery. Tremendous loss of life. In fact, my, my dad made the off-the-cuff off the remark to me once that his uh, career as a dory man was, was uh, quite unique because he had never been on a boat where anybody was lost, which kind of hit home to me. It was The point being, there was a lot of loss of life. I mean, it was a tough way to make a, make a buck. Finally, the halibut pioneers realized that setting gear off the schooner itself was the best method of conducting their fishery. 
think the Seymour was the first one. It was considered the most modern schooner of her time that uh, started setting gear off the uh, off the stern of the boat itself and yeah, eliminated the dory. So that also that cut down on the number of crew to some extent, even though they're using rather large crews at that time. Like the boats themselves, halibut fishing operations on the schooners look very much as they did nearly a century ago. For months at a time, they cover thousands of miles of ocean at eight or nine knots. Jerdy estimates Tortenschuld has traveled well over a million miles in her 100-year career. You know, we'll leave in the spring and we'll, we'll fish a black on quota first. Uh, however long it takes us to get that, then we'll, uh, you know, make those three or four or whatever it is trips that, uh, that it takes to make that, that season. Then we'll take a little break home, and then we'll uh, and we'll take off take off westward, go up to the Bering Sea and fish some quota we've got up there, fish some quota we've got west in the Shumigan Islands, and then come back into, into the, uh, what we call, you know, what's our main area, and, uh, and fish up what, whatever we haven't, didn't catch when we were black hunt fishing. We have uh, six guys, including myself. Um, everyone on the boat does everything. Uh, there's, we have a, a cook that cooks, and we also have an engineer that takes care of the engine. And I run the pilot house, but everybody is on deck, you know, working with the fish all the time. Nowadays, we go about 18 hours on and six hours off. We use what's called uh, long line gear. We have gear uh, for hell of it. We use gear that's anchored to the bottom. These hooks are baited with uh, the salmon number three, not, not number one. <laughs> Codfish, sometimes we buy pollock for bait as well. And uh, we'll mix in some herring in there. And we, I like to have a little mixture, a little bit of a smorgasbord, sport, so the fish have a choice. Long lining is a passive fishery. Uh, the fish can choose to bite or not bite. And uh, the quality of your bait, and sometimes a variety of bait, can make a difference on attracting fish for bait. Step is to get all get all that gear baited and get it ready to go. Then you wind up setting the bag and fly it. Set the blue line, throw the anchor. Gear goes over the stern, sinks to the bottom. Gets anchored to the other end. Another blue line comes up to the surface. The bag and flag at that end as well. And uh, you know we'll set anywhere from twenty, maybe you know twenty, maybe thirty of those hundred and fifty fathom skates. The boats and the fishermen aren't the only well-worn components of the halibut fishery. Deckhands organized the Deep Sea Fishermen's Union in 1912. The vessel owners responded by establishing their own group, the Fishing Vessel Owners Association, in 1914. I was a member of the Deep Sea Fishermen's Union from uh, 54 to, to 60, and uh, when I first joined, I know it's, it was, uh, we had well over a thousand members. Had some pretty interesting meetings too because every but about 25% of them would show up drunk and <laughs> the busiest guy was a sergeant in arms. He was throwing guys out all the time. Yeah, so this is a union boat. All the all the crew crew members are belong to Deep Sea Fishermen's Union of the Pacific, and uh, and I belong to uh, Fishing Vessel Owners Association. The association had an agreement with the union, I think, since 1914, if I remember right. And we've always stood on the side of conservation. I think our the Seattle Vessel Owners Association is it kind of mirrors the boats. They're, they're very conservative, productive, and we've always been cautious. So we have a healthy fishery, very healthy fishery, and we have good markets. 
Well, the, the, we have the same group that, you know, managing it that's managed it since, uh, you know, the early 1900s, and it's been real consistent. I, I really think that the fishermen that are involved in this fishery are more concerned with the health of the fishery than making a dollar. I, I think that's the main reason why.